Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingsher. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In this episode, we are talking with Scott Irvin, founder and CEO of Hirehand, a tech company that helps companies staff more flexible. Prior to starting up Hirehand, Scott worked with McKinsey specializing in workforce planning. We talked about how he's seen the pandemic evolve and how you should be bringing back staff and how to plan it. Scott underlines that staffing flexible will become a core discipline to master as a hospitality operator, both in the reopening and beyond. Scott gives some great advice in the end of the podcast, some great thinking about planning your workforce and much more in this episode. Grab your pen, notebook, coffee and enjoy. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Early June, the pandemic is still going on and there's still a bit of a wait on what's going to happen, but there's some clarity and the, the opening starting coming for hospitality. And for that means also bringing back your staff and your workforce and the challenges around that. Today, I have a guest where that's going to be quite central, where we're going to be talking about workforce and the challenges around that, bringing them back. Scott Irvin from Hirehand, welcome to to the, the podcast. Thanks for having me, Michael. And Scott, for people that haven't heard about who you are and Higher Hand, can you just give them the quick download or the elevator pitch about who you are and what Higher Hand is about? No, oh, thank you very much. And, and I really admire the leadership you've shown and taking the industry through these challenging times. And yeah, I'm really grateful to have a chance to speak with you today. So we at Higher Hand are a technology company that at the core of it helps organizations staff more flexibly and do it in a couple of ways. First, in the way we engage most with the fantastic hospitality industry is via an external labor marketplace that has really you know, worked in our origins with the fantastic street food scene here in London and has grown to work with a lot of the independent and then up to about 10 or 15 casual dining and, and fast casual businesses in London. In addition, you know, we have a, a software product that helps businesses, particularly in food processing and manufacturing, build their own flexible workforces using their own internal extra availability, a bit of a marketplace within themselves. And you know, by way of my background before coming into this, I did a lot of work as a workforce planner at McKinsey, which is a consulting firm that works with a lot of big companies on how to think through you know, problems not dissimilar from when you have to turn on a new location, you know, how you might you know, ramp up staff. And, and so in some ways, I've been thinking about these, these workforce planning issues for a long time. And in particular, the reason I started Higher Hand was I came into contact with a group of fantastic individuals, you know, many of whom were looking for flexible work that didn't necessarily fit into a full-time job or a part-time job, and many from some challenging backgrounds you know, as well, and saw the hospitality industry as a fantastic way to find those individuals work. And you know, in some ways, uh, the earliest days was matching the fantastic street food traders of London with people, again, looking for five or 10 or 15 hours a week of work. And in some ways, that was where it all began. Are you only in London or are you also outside London with your with your platform as it is now? You know, via the technology, we have partner organizations, in particular one in Atlanta that we've already kind of in, engaged and, and seen in a market that's you know already been turning back on, if you will. And then via the, the technology, are able to service, you know, clients, you know, across the UK. And what I might mention in the context of, of COVID, we've had the, the real fortune to partner with a great group of people to launch an initiative called Spare Hand, which is actually slightly outside the, you know, the remit of, of hospitality solely. has worked with a bunch of fantastic community groups to organize volunteers to help those that are self-isolating. And basically have been the rails for meals for the NHS, groups like Chefs and Schools and Magic Breakfast, as they've been delivering meals and other aspects to organizations uh, across the UK. And it's really been a pleasure to to be a part of that. And I think we're just hitting a milestone of 500,000 meals delivered. So in terms of having the marketplace, we're primarily, you know, in London with some sister organizations, you know, in the US. And then with the technology, you're able, obviously, to work in particular across the UK. When people use uh, your marketplace, both the, the operator and the individual, what is unique about that compared to many other things where you can find, you know, part-time staff or agency staff for that sake? What is the unique thing about this platform and why why is it's different. The unique selling point is, is really we've we, we've thought a great deal about the match. I would say even short of short of maybe dating applications, you know, we've been really you know, thoughtful about how we think about getting the right individual in contact with the right work opportunity at the right time. And that comes down to some of the fantastic engineers we have working with us. But effectively, it transpires in terms of a 30-factor matching algorithm that rank orders the most suitable individuals you know, for a particular shift, and then a really intelligent invite sequencing engine that then invites them in a 
way that starts at the top and in, in a really thoughtful way, you know, moves down that list. And what makes this unique is that of those factors, you know, that go into the rank order, over half of them are in the interest of, of the worker. Aspects such as how many hours per week an individual wants, how much notice an individual wants before getting offered jobs. And what we really found is, is the more you place, if you will, the interests of, of the worker on a similar plane, obviously to the, the needs of a business, you create a, a really kind of robust relationship. And I think it's worth saying that what we see kind of out in the market is as opposed to maybe this thoughtful approach that, that we try to ultimately adopt by a, a sense sometimes of a bit of a filter to see who's available and then blasting a shift off to everyone on the list and seeing who responds fastest. In, in terms of you know, the social mission we see at higher hand, what that means to us is that if you're a worker, you actually never are off work because even when you aren't on shift, you're having to constantly monitor and check your phone to have that fastest finger to accept the shift to get that work for the next day. And for us, you know, being much more deliberate, much more thoughtful, giving people time to accept shifts in advance, you know, is part of also making, you know, a more flexible workforce, a more sustainable workforce, you know, for obviously the businesses and the workers as well. The pandemic hit everyone and including you and, uh, and everybody has a story within this situation. But again, especially your customers and users, the hospitality industry is one of the hardest hit to get with uh, maybe healthcare. Besides healthcare, they're busy, but they, they, they're quite under pressure as well. What have your your observations been since now we are about 12 weeks in, almost 12 weeks into this journey called the COVID-19? What have your learnings and observations been from, from a marketplace and what do you see is happening right now? You know, it is just unprecedented times and just have huge amounts of admiration for, you know, in particular, the operators that, that we've had the good pleasure to work with and obviously the entire industry for how, you know, an effect in around, you know, a week and in, in mid-March, everything was in some ways brought to a standstill. And obviously many of the investors you've had and, and yourself included, you know, we in some ways have adopted that posture of in some ways, obviously waiting for as and when we're ready to, to reopen. You know, in some ways, as I kind of observed the, you know, the industry, what's been hugely, I think, um, exciting is, is, is how, you know, even amidst the huge challenges that people have faced, in many cases, the first port of call was how can we contribute? And so many of the kind of clients we've worked with opened up their kitchens, you know, just like you to start delivering meals for those who were self-isolating, you know, as we were fortunate enough to use the technology to support in that way as well. And, you know, in some ways, there's something proportional about one of the hardest you know, hit industries also being one of the most generous industries with how it's, you know, allocated, you know, resources at a challenging time to really contribute to the public good. So I suppose, oddly enough, it's really shown the true colors, I think, of a lot of people and the quality of the individuals in this industry that is, yeah, it really leaves me humbled to, to have a chance to be part of it. How would you describe the the, the phase we're in right now? Uh, I, do you think we're very close to a, a, a strong reopening of the industry or how are you going to see it in the next three months going to lay out? Because there's a lot of noise around right now and a lot of uncertainty for many many operators especially sit down restaurants and normal restaurant facilities as they they start to, has to open more within the next couple of months mm, absolutely and and in some ways michael i'm listening to your podcast to get advice so I'm, i'm now in a position of having to having to share it i think the one thing that is fairly clear to me is is we don't really know you know putting back on my consulting hat, you know, in situations with a high degree of uncertainty, which to say the least, this is one of them. You know, I, I really think that, you know, we all benefit from perhaps use a boring consulting gym, but scenario planning and really thinking through a, a variety of options in some ways doing so now while there's a bit of capacity, perhaps before some initial operations open up. But I think you really need to, you know, open up where it does seem like not only does the opportunity to open you know, the institutions present itself, but then you have a kind of quick response of footfall thereafter, more of a, you know, maybe a base case. And then in some ways, a certainly a worst case scenario where it does seem like we're in a more prolonged period of low customer demand. I'm sure all, all the operators out there are doing that. But I think in a kind of environment of complexity, I think you have to have that. And you know, we have through operations in Atlanta. And there you actually have seen almost actually in the month of you know mid-May, a lot of the operators reopening. And, you know, the feedback that, that we've seen there is ultimately that, you know, although open, you know, customer de demand was very slow, you know, to return. And so those operators that in some ways, perhaps optimistically, you know, either kind of opened hours, you know, secured produce and brought back staff for a kind of as normal opening quickly found themselves, you know, in some ways overburdened. So I think kind of prudence and caution, and I suppose, you know, not taking one day as fact, but looking for patterns and all of the kind of activity are some of the kind of basic kind of suggestions that, that I'd make just because I think it's worth remembering that obviously kind of us opening the doors is not the same as having the kind of the customer demand to, to ultimately, you know, drive what we need. There's been a lot of conversations about how do you make the customer feel safe and their 
know, by also the employee. And it's all about this, you know, trust, trust in that is actually safe for me, first of all, to leave my home, to go out and engage with society again. Can I actually travel safely around? There's all these question that there's also been a situation where there's just too many people in areas actually that scares people away from the area again so when we talk about trust which is a very difficult thing because we all need different levels of it it's like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs we're in the bottom of it and to be safe for some people would be different from other people and that's what I'm I'm discovered here so what about like staff as they have to come back what you're doing is like bringing staff in back into the industry have you had like seen from the people that's on your platform they're concerned about how do I actually go safe back into to work and how, how would that work out for me absolutely and, and i think you know, one of the best parts of the industry is the you know, kind of the, the open communication quite often that you can have with you know with the staff and the workforce and there'll be a variety of different ways in which you know a number of the operators you know, in london are currently kind of engaging with their staff certainly many will be on on furlough you know some staff you know maybe especially those that come from abroad may have returned home you know and then others you know, there may have been the case where operators had to let them go. And so I think, you know, all of this comes back to communication. And in this period of time before reopening, you know, establishing those lines of communication, you know, understanding where people are from their you know, current situations and their aspirations to come back to work. And that will obviously include financial and non-financial you know, matters as well. You know, in some ways in this scenario plan where you prepare for quick reopening, you know, medium, and then, you know, very slow, you know, starting to really think about the personalities and kind of needs of those staff members combined, obviously, with, you know, the resource requirements you have as a business, and then really creating a staffing plan for for each of those. And I think, you know, flexibility, you know, will be key, obviously, in, in, in all of these plans. And for those that are using the furlough scheme, I think one of the real benefits, obviously, is the ability from July to bring staff back on a part-time basis. But even that is not without challenge, because a good amount of administration required in terms of doing that. And a challenge once you start bringing staff back, for instance, from furlough, will then be making sure you give the individuals when they come back from furlough all of the hours that they have in some ways been brought back to do in a part-time basis. And in some ways, you'd want to do that before bringing the next person back from furlough. So I suppose all to be said, given a lot of these, I think, really challenging in the moment decisions to be made, the more at this time you can kind of map out what could be that future, the better. From from your point of view, where you work with these people that goes in and take these extra hours, they are like, you know, the uh, either emergency staff or the they're used to add up uh, your normal workforce. Have you seen that, you know, there's already people starting to plan and starting to plan to get, you know, use the flexible workforce you provide more than bringing back their own staff in the beginning? Or have, is it very, you know, uh, what do you call it, quiet market right now before mm. before the opening? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, to the extent that, you know, we you know, are in, in close touch with the clients we work with, and, and there's a real sense of wanting to, you know, wait and see, you know, what ultimately you know, customers will do. And I think that there's so many different factors at play. A lot of the restaurants we work with in London, for instance, have a deep you know, reliance on, you know, offices and them ultimately providing a lot of the lunch trade and the after hours, you know, trade as well. And so, you know, really wanting to not only understand in general how customers are thinking, but also how major office groups are thinking about bringing people back into London, you know, as and when. In general, the clients that I'm talking to are really looking for caution, looking, you know, primarily at earliest September to really be looking at where they see, you know, operations returning to any way normal. And then the majority as well, you know, their first kind of port of call is to think about how they intelligently use their their full-time staff, the majority of which are on furlough at the moment. And I think certainly in the period from July through October, when you have that that flexible ability in some ways with the, the furlough scheme, you know, for those that have really taken advantage of that, you know, a lot of the thought process is going into how to, to engage most intelligently there. In general, given how much we you know, think of in our business around staffing flexibly, that will be, I think, the name of the game for the you know, the next period of time. And certainly come October, you know, when the furlough scheme, you know, ends, it will necessarily be then thinking about how you have that flexibility without the, you know, the government support. Some of the conversations I had with operators out there, some of them are quite concerned that you know people that come from other european countries went back to those countries when the the lockdown started they went back to see families and so on would you think there is people that will not come back and join the workforce we had before and also there's people that has transited into other jobs they're doing deliveries now they work for amazon or retailers and maybe they found out that that's quite a good job i know i have a job here right now and maybe it's too tricky for me to go back into hospitality do you think this even though people say that because there will be restaurants closing and there will be enough hands. Do you think maybe we're a bit too optimistic about that? And actually, we're going to see there will be in some periods when we're fully up and running again, be shortage of people, which we had before the lockdown happened as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that even established businesses, as they look to the reopening, will have to consider it, you know, almost a new launch, if you will. And that new launch comes from a completely different 
type of you know customer pattern for how and when you know they come into your establishment. It comes down to you know as well the, the workforce that that you have and, and look to call upon. And so I think that the key you know in this period of time, given all the unknown variables, is just to be in real close communication with that workforce to understand for those people that are obviously are remained in the UK and are you know ready to come back to work to understand what what they need. But in terms of the overall labor dynamic, you know I, I think across you know not only hospitality but a lot of the other industries that have been affected. I mean there's just such change on the supply and the demand side. You know I think we'll be kind of feeling our way through for the next I'd say year. And in that environment. You know, it's all about, I think, having transparency with, with the people you work with to say we're, we're kind of learning as we go. And again, I think it is maintaining as much flexibility as possible, given, I think, in some ways, the overarching concern, and understandably so, for a lot of operators will be survival up to 40% or even higher of the you know, businesses you know, in the hospitality industry with the potential not yet to, to reopen post-lockdown. You know, just that alone will create such a different dynamic and landscape. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you because I think we've seen the first wave and now there has been a lot of support with governments and there's been a lot of actions put in place to, you know, get businesses over this period. But now when they have to reopen, it all becomes very clear what we are talking about and what we are looking at. And I think there'll be, you know, some of these businesses that can't even maybe afford to take their staff back when the furlough starts to reduce. And that means, you know, they have to think about restructuring the whole workforce. And also because people want to consume and buy food in a different way, there's less need for human contact because people have implemented technology to take care of that for a given period to people feel more safe. And I think that that's also an interesting take on, on how much workforce do we actually need as you had implemented a lot of technology if you have been quite progressive in this period of lockdown. Mm, no, no, absolutely. I, I know you obviously have a close relationship with uh, you know Vita Mojo and a lot of the work that they're doing around front of house touchscreens. And in some ways, you know what, what this you know, lockdown has done is probably accelerated some trends that were already moving in the industry towards greater adoption of technology and a real sense of you know increased automation. I mean, just from the perch of even over the last five years that I've been kind of deeply involved, you know, on the labor side of these things, we've seen London you know reduce its you know average shift length you know down I'd say up to two hours as businesses have increasingly started you know staffing in I think a a much more fragmented way, you know, if you will. And you can think of some of the businesses like Pret, you know, perhaps, you know, you know, McDonald's being one of the most significant that really just staffed to, to peak breakfast, lunch, and dinner times with pretty significant troughs in between. On the one hand, you know, obviously the COVID environment has really unprecedented, but also it's, you know, pushed trends that were moving before. And I guess from my perspective, you know, a long-term quite bullish on on the industry just because of, as we all know, hospitality is more than, you know, just a, a means of delivering food, but an experience and, and just such a source of joy for so many people. And I think once there's a greater sense amongst the kind of population of an all clear, you know, we'll be really desperately wanting these you know, memorable experiences that we can all point to of, of being, you know, in, in Bear Kitchen and other fantastic establishments, but it's going to be a rocky short and midterm. And so in some ways, the more we're prepared for that, you know, the better. Let's just take the London market, which has been, you know, very dominated by big chains and, and so on. How do you think that market's going to look in 12, 18 months if you were just giving your 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 perspective about it? In, in terms of even a horizon, 12 to 18 months, I still see in the kind of short to midterm. I think in some ways in 12 to 18 months, the market will slightly be dictated by by those that have been able to you know, basically have the, you know, the the strategy, the plan, and the kind of resources to survive. Because that may be disproportionately you know, larger players that have a stronger balance sheet you know, that are able to kind of you know withstand some of the challenges of the next 12 to 18 months. Although a lot of what I know you're doing on this podcast and what you know, I'd, I'd love to help out however I can is making sure that obviously the independence and the smaller chain businesses that are really the dynamism and the vibrancy of, of this sector and the engines of employment are able to move as well. But I think ultimately, beyond that fact, I think a lot of things will change about people's perspectives you know, post lockdown. And I think it, it's being kind of quite thoughtful about how you kind of have your experiences out of the home. And I, and I really think that then redounds to the benefit of, of independence and, and smaller players who create and really establish local bonds, you know, with community. I mean, it's a bit of an aside, but kind of certainly from the work we've been doing with, you know, with Spare Hand, just seeing how communities are coming together to support each other in this really challenging time and bonds being made and, you know, a real sense of kind of localism, you know, that in some ways you know, flies a bit in the face of the large kind of, you know, cookie cutter franchised business. And so I really feel strongly about a long-term trend of a, a sense of investing in local communities, local businesses, and we think you'll see consumers much more, I think, intentional about you know where they spend their their money 
and not least because of the challenge environments, but also about wanting to support more independent and you know smaller unit types of businesses. But I think that that type of customer preference you know will only come about <laughs> assuming we're able to kind of survive the next twelve to eighteen months, which is why I think just being so thoughtful and sensible in this period is critical. It's very interesting to say with the independent and local if they can do the bridge because also it's a, it's a rocky ride for them because they don't have massive cash reserves to to get on the other side. But for the the ones that comes over on the other side and can continue telling their strong local story, I'm sure that you know you would see more activity in local and regional restaurant offering. They definitely have an opportunity. There's no doubt about that as they rise from this and also because they often have some quite amazing stories and they are often you know able to do some very local impact in their communities as well. And you know the good operators I've seen it myself living in Brighton have really gone beyond what you expected of them with all the pressures they had helping hospitals care homes homeless people and trying still to, to run a business with takeaway or whatever they did and been very very adapted to this and some of them have been very quickly to use technology that they didn't touch before because I had a conversation the other day about it's interesting to see there hasn't been a resistant but there's definitely been a slow adaption of technology within the industry like compared to other industries. And then suddenly when this hit us, we had adapted out of nowhere, you know, suddenly everybody was doing e-commerce, you know. I don't know if you've seen that a talk about how can you digitalize your workforce and how can you actually use technology to get that overview over your workforce and actually utilizing it better than it did before, even you know, scheduling systems are there, but they have never really been utilized in the capacity they need to when you plan your workforce. I don't know if you have heard and seen similar kind of trends as well when it comes to to the workforce in, in the industry. Yeah, no, and maybe before jumping to that, one one example I'd love to highlight that just I think kind of really encapsulates this is Zoe from Zoe's Ghana Kitchen. She's a really fantastic kind of operator who's obviously admits challenges because she has a large event space business, has just flipped her work and is now providing meals to a number of self-isolated in the area. And I guess for me, Zoe is the real future of, of ultimately, you know, during this period of time, having invested in her local community that as in, you know, when the kind of industry is back on its feet, those are the people that will, I think, kind of be committed to working with her and beyond. And so I think it's 100% right, Michael, to kind of, with the colors shown during this period, you know, really plan the seeds for how some of the, the independents and the, the local businesses can really kind of flourish going forward. But in terms of the digitization, it's, it's just such a trend. And I think actually hospitality has been, you know, compared to other industries, ahead of the game you know, in this for a while, you know, not least because of having point of sale systems that have been able to give huge amounts of data about when sales are coming. And as a result, kind of how you need to think about, you know, staffing up your workforce. For me, I think what's What's exciting is that the stage we've been in in the industry is effectively slightly around how do we get the data right and start to bring in, you know, in certain aspects like you've seen sort of via you know, via Mojo and others, touch screens, you know, and, and the next stage I think will be how do we really create a, a positive experience, you know, for a customer that incorporates both kind of intelligence around screens and also around kind of people. And I like to think about the next stage we're probably moving into, you know, in some ways, you know, automation and machines will do what they do best, but making sure people do what they do best as well. And that's ultimately about creating a warm, hospitable environment for people coming to really spend their money with you really creating a relationship and a bond. And so I think kind of when you start talking about digitizing your workforce, I think there can be a bit of a kind of sense of, oh, yes, yes, it's all happening. But as you start to think a bit more nuanced about it, there are certain things that, you know, perhaps you know, machines can do better. But certainly the human connection that, frankly, most of the people I know that got into this industry for and really kind of keeps them sustained on a daily basis, this actually will always, in my view, at least be, be done by, by individuals creating that sense of hospitality and the sense of making a hospitable environment. And I think that if they're, I don't call it a backlash, but as we kind of start to move to a place where the digitization has run its course, I hope there's a real sense of, of wow, there's still a huge amount of work and a huge amount of kind of room for fantastic personal engagement that will really be need to be done by a human leaving and breathing workforce as well. Yeah, and that's quite interesting. I had uh, Hugo from Leon on the podcast, and we were talking exactly about that, how, you know, if you understand that you can automate some things, that's actually just a waste of your, your time and energy in a way, both as a manager as an employee, if they are automated as best as they can, and you can walk away from spreadsheets and so on you can actually then focusing more on the human experience if from a manager's point of view it's spend time on leading and from a employee's point of view spending time on delivering a better service in a way but of course you need to, to train people in that it doesn't come from out of the blue but again it gives an opportunity but again it also means that you really have to implement that technology so it works because there's a lot of technology there in my experience and the people i talk with is sometimes just it's ticked off but it's not really implemented and it doesn't give that effect they are looking for. But also guess this is the time where people are really adding technology now that technology also is going to be improved because people are going to be using it more vigorous and efficient than they did before because now they have to. 
because they can't get in contact or they can't do the interaction or what it is they need the technology to do that mm, no no of course and i think technology will play you know this kind of public health role to a certain degree in the next you know, six to 12 months but you know in some ways that the technology becomes you know more ubiquitous and becomes more standardized across the industry what's going to stand out is less who has the touchpad but who has the individual that alongside the touchpad was really engaging and you know shared a bit of the kind of story of the you know restaurant you're in and asked about your day in a way that you know really left a mark and ultimately you know for that kind of critical return customer you know it's less going to be technology as a differentiator. It's going to be that personal touch. You know, maybe this is where I'm a bit optimistic here, but I, I ultimately think that oddly enough, the more you actually, you know, involve technology in your operations, the more a really, you know, distinguished human and really personal kind of approach stands out. And, and so oddly enough, that, that's kind of the, the future that I see where we actually have a whole new appreciation for the kind of skills of our fantastic, you know, front of house workers, as opposed to a future where you know, they're all in some ways replaced by robots, if you will. Having really good human skills really now becomes really important because technology is one thing but within this pandemic crisis there's also the wave of this you know mental health crisis we're talking about because there's going to be a lot of difficult things so just that being able to be very human and you can get that experience somewhere when you go out it becomes center for where you spend your money as well because you can get a lot of digital transactions but you need that human being as you said as well and the human hospitality is going to be so critical on the other side because we, we're going to be so much under pressure no matter who we are because it's going to be a rough ride everybody can see that it's very clear so so again you being able to give that free space I can see where you're coming from as an operator that'd be critical I will definitely myself be looking for that more than than just a transaction mm, and I think, I think you have to and I think in some ways the hospitality sector has shown itself as certainly more than a, a place to go Go get food, not least in this, you know, this this crisis. You know, given how it's responded, fed the NHS workers, been a source of inspiration for community members. I mean, pubs, you know, have always played that larger role within kind of local communities. As American, you know, it's something I kind of really admired coming, you know, over and, and seeing seen in, in the country. And and I think that if you think of your operation as a, you know, obviously the, the means by which you maybe engage the community mostly is by delivering food, but you are a community organization and you're playing this essential role in, in a time of just unprecedented challenge to community. And if that's the kind of mindset that you take, that people like Zoe I've seen take and, and others, then it's just a natural kind of like outpouring of that, that you're going to be a place that's as much about people, obviously, as the delivery of your of your core service. All this amidst all this, I suppose, the conversations we've had about being flexible, being sensible in the next, you know, 12 months, in particular during this unprecedented time of pressure. I think, you know, my push is to kind of, you know, certainly as you kind of try to make it through the next 12 months, you know, what will be most important is keeping that humanity amidst the challenge, you know, not letting it get to us against the, amidst the time, you know, tough times ahead. Yeah, it's a very interesting, very good friend of mine, a very seasoned operator and a very senior said to me, Michael, this is all about caring and compassion, nothing else. It's nothing about business skills. It's about caring and compassion. Then you will get on the other side, very healthy and in as good as place as you can be. But if, if you forget that, then you're going to fail. And that was very interesting. That was his first reaction to all this. And that was, you know, 12 weeks ago. And, and I think he's been absolutely right. You've seen the people has cared and will be remembered, as you said, the people that went out of the way of doing more than just, you know, trying to save their business. And that's incredible to see as well. Keeping yourself uh, over water in, in this uh, situation, being a CEO and a founder for a, a startup, and, and I guess you, you, you're hit like anyone else. How have you dealt with all this and how and you kept yourself going? You know, in terms of, you know, you know, higher hand, we're so fortunate to have a fantastic team and a board and group of, you know, investors that have really, you know, in some ways just been nothing but supportive, you know, in this period where, you know, obviously as a service provider to the hospitality industry, you know, we're on pause as well. I suppose in the kind of medium and also long term, you know, I do think that, you know, staffing flexibly, you know, will be a requisite, you know, in some ways to, to make it through this period and certainly into the future. And even you know, for us beyond the hospitality sector, you know, seeing huge other industries that are now for the first time grappling with some of the questions that, you know, I mentioned hospitality has been grappling with for, you know, a number of years. So for us, I think it's about being present and being, you know, as supportive as we can and, and you know, being ready and willing to, to serve the hospitality industry as and when it comes back. And it's also, you know, given the nature of our business, having technology that has application, you know, in a variety of sectors, you know, certainly trying to support there, you know, as well. But I suppose for us, I think it's also been about, like you, you mentioned, kind of letting go a bit and just in some ways doing what we can to prepare under a variety of different scenarios. And yeah, and kind of at our best trying to kind of focus on, you know, caring and being supportive where we can. 
And I guess for us, the main focus of that has been on, you know, on Sparehand, which is, you know, you know, working with some fantastic people just to, in some ways, become the rails for a, a decent proportion of the mechanism by which we're delivering meals to our most vulnerable in the UK. And for us, that's just been such a kind of positive experience and, and, and one that just is really meaningful to be able to use the technology for good at this time. Yeah, I think that, that's been, uh, you know, very amazing. Uh, I'm part of a business called The Bear Kitchen, and, uh, and we used uh, your your Sparehand technology as well, and that, that was like... Like a very positive experience as well because these people that came out they were really fired up by being part of doing something good when we delivered food into hospitals so yeah so i know that's just been a massive massive uh, help you've been giving there so definitely a heads up for that what about from where we stand today and, and moving forward what is the, the three pieces of advice you would give and if you only is one that's also fine scott yeah the three pieces of advice then i guess then the question would be will i follow them michael which is always the danger of a <laughs> I'm giving advice. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the first one is is to kind of I think fully accept that you're not in control as a CEO or as a leader. I think a lot of you know how you you know establish you know, kind of a direction for your company and and try to inspire others is about you know vision and clarity. And I think that applies certainly in times of more stability. But this is a time in which just the kind of overall landscape is so uncertain. I think just first acknowledging to yourself, which is very hard to do, and I, I have varying degrees of ability to do so that you aren't you know, in control. I think the second thing is with that, then to be sensible about creating a few different scenarios that, that could kind of approximate what the future could be like. So if it does come to fruition, you do have a plan that, you know, in the kind of heat of heat of the moment you can turn to. And in this context, obviously, we've talked about how to think about staffing. This will apply to a number of different aspects of, of what you do. And I have the third thing, and I really thought I was interested. You mentioned that friend who kind of speaks to you, right? I think is is, is get a coach or, or, or get a friend because as you're kind of in the kind of heat of you know kind of this experience, trying to figure out which scenario you might be in. You know, a lot of it will be about having people that can speak into your life and, and try to support you, you know, as you try to kind of show leadership. And, and I think that to think you can do it all on your own or even kind of rely solely on maybe, you know, teammates is probably a lot. And so I think having friends that can kind of like or kind of mentors that can come to you and say, you know, remember to be caring, remember to be compassionate amidst kind of wondering how you're going to you know, financially make it through this period. Having them to kind of like restore you back to the kind of fundamental reasons why you're doing this in the first place, which I think kind of requires an outside perspective sometimes or if not a friend, a peer who you really respect. I just think having that type of reset to yourself every once in a while is what can help you get through what just even at the best of worlds is going to be a really unprecedented next 12 to 18 months. And so that's a bit of the medicine I'm trying to take for myself. And yeah, maybe the last thing is to kind of have optimism, right? Because I suppose I draw huge amounts of inspiration from, you know, how the communities have come together, you know, how in times of need, you know, hospitality has been front and center and what they've done. And I think that as we kind of you know think through who's going to kind of turn up through our doors on day one, the people who are going to turn up are the ones that you were kind of with during this period. And so I think kind of, you know, taking heart in the fact that, you know, there'll be some unexpected kind of real opportunities, you know, and or kind of, you know, pleasant surprises you know, that come on the outside of this and being open to that too, while being realistic about the downside is probably the, the kind of way I would hope to approach it. Super, super advice, Scott, especially that, you know, I struggle with this myself, that you're not in control because I always talk about the circle of influence influence from uh, Stephen R. Covey. And I, I had a, even that is very difficult to control. You can only thing you control is yourself and what's happening in, in, in your brain. And I think that's, and again, just acknowledging that took me some time as well. I was totally agreeing that because normally when you're an entrepreneur or business leader, you want to set the pace, you want to create clarity so you can take your team or your own actions in the right direction. It's a, it's a very good thing. It's a very healthy thing maybe to, to actually try and the whole thing around getting a mentor. I totally agree. Everybody should have a mentor it could be a friend it can also be somebody that you actually have found that you you want to have that and then the you have to have hope we need to have hope in all this you know we cannot just say that sit down and, and give up we need to give hope to the industry ourselves and our colleagues our families that, that there's another side of this and there always is and again you know the care and compassion as you mentioned yeah so super super great advice there so God, thank you so much for uh, spending your your valuable time and coming on the podcast and talking a bit about the pandemic and where we are, but also again talking about our workforce and how we bring that back and the, how you see that from an operator's point of view and, and your great advice in the end. No, thank you. And thank you for all you're doing to give us guidance and hope in this period also, Michael. Really appreciate it. Scott, 
thank you so much for your great thinking around workforce planning as we reopen and beyond for hospitality businesses. And more important, thank you so much for your great advice that you are not in control and you should get yourself a mentor to navigate the storm and most important of all, have some optimism and hope for the journey. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, rate, subscribe to one of our channels. If the subject around workforce planning interests you, I will recommend you also to listen to our previous episode, episode 41, How Technology Can Boost Productivity with David Kelly. Thanks to Let's Talk Video Production for your support on the podcast. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.